And you know, as I always say, every single lesson that I give is always given here, first and foremost. Our lesson tonight is simply titled, Words to Live By. I was feeling a little sentimental as I prepared this lesson this past week, and I was got to thinking about all the different preachers I have heard during my years of sitting in the pews, growing up in the church, and throughout my adult life, and thinking about the folks in life who have given me words of encouragement, words to live by. Think about it in your own life. How many times in life have you gone through a different event? Maybe you've been to a wedding or a graduation. And they'll quote some famous person's words that leaves the folks sitting there that afternoon thinking about things. Thinking about their life and how they can apply what they've heard. You go to a funeral, we quote scripture at a funeral. Different things throughout life that we live by. Words we live by. Words that hit us, that strike us when someone says something. And we say, you know, that really meant something to me. I, I understand where that person's coming from. And we begin to take that phrase or that quote on into our life. And how many times do you find yourself also quoting your parents? Or your grandparents? Or someone in your life, well, dad what said this. Dad always said, mom always said, these are words to live by, aren't they? These are things that were instilled in you that you hold on to this day. Things that guide your life. Well, folks, we have an entire word prepared by our Heavenly Father that are full of these words. The psalmist knew this, and it's one of my favorites in Psalms 119, verse 105. Here we're told that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Simply put, the psalmist is telling us there that God's word is simply a book full of words to live by. Words that not only guide our life, but will guide us to a heavenly home. They will direct our life. How many folks in life sit around and they, they say, I have no purpose. Or as we age a little bit in life, we get a few years on us, we'll say, I don't know why I'm still here. What purpose do I serve? If only they would open and flip the pages of God's word, they would find that direction that they so desperately seek. Tonight, I'm going to share with you four words that were given to me in my life. Four words we've heard quite a bit sitting in pews, but four words you're going to find out have much more of a meaning behind them. Having said that, we go into our first one here tonight. Number one is the first word to live by is the simple word Bible. <laughs> one we've heard quite a bit growing up in the church or sitting in a, a church pew throughout our life. Word Bible. I was taught through my life that the word Bible, and it was instilled in me, stands for basic instructions before leaving earth. That pretty well sums it up, doesn't it? The Bible is the basic instructions that you and I need to get to heaven before we leave this earth. And God's word agrees. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, that there we are to study to show ourself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed so we can rightly divide the word of truth. I always like the word thyself or yourself as Paul says there. He says study to show yourself approved unto God. So you can be a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed. And you can rightly divide that word of truth. The Bible is the basic instructions we need before we leave this earth. And Paul's agreeing. He's saying that in your life, if you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to take on God and the name of Jesus Christ in this life, you need to be a well-prepared student. Not only so you can prove yourself unto God when that final day comes and you take a knee before your Savior and give an account of the things we do in this life, but no, so you yourself can rightly divide the word of truth. 
so that you yourself can divide God's word and understand where it's leading you to. How to get to heaven. I like to refer to the Bible as the GPS. God's plan for salvation. How many times in life have we been on a trip and you go somewhere you've never been before? Back in the old days, you'd go to a map, wouldn't you? These days, you have the GPS on your phone. But what happens in either case if that map is outdated wrong? Or these days, if your GPS isn't updated and you see that beautiful sign that says detour, what do we do? We panic, don't we? We've never been there. We don't know where we're going. We don't know what we're doing. We're at the mercy of the road. And a lot of times we'll pull off and we'll get directions from somebody, won't we? Now, was that three lefts and then a right or what? How many times has that happened to us? We don't have the instructions right. We don't have the direction. And when we don't have the direction or the instructions, we're going to get lost. And we're going to take some off ramps that's going to lead us into some places we never wanted to be. It's the same in our Christian life. If we don't study, if we don't, or if we don't have the ability to divide God's word, we're going to take some off ramps in our Christian life. We're going to end up places we never thought we would with folks we never should have been. But that Bible, oh, that Bible, those basic instructions before leaving earth are what we need to keep us on track, to keep us on the straight and narrow way unto God. And not only for us, but rightly divide the word of truth for those out there. For those many, many, many folks who have chosen not to enter these doors tonight or doors like these across the country today. Those folks who deem it unimportant to believe in God. Those are the folks that need us to rightly divide the word of truth. How many folks today have no idea why abortion is wrong. They see it as you're just being a condemning, judging person who took a side on one side or the other. Have no idea that it's against God's word. How many of us are able to rightly divide the word of truth? To be able to explain to those folks why it's wrong. <laughs> Because let me tell you, a lot of times when you just go up to someone and say, well, this is wrong because I say this, they're not going to listen. But when you go to that same person and you're able to show them in the word of God where it says that exact thing, they're a little more likely to listen to you. They're a little more likely to contemplate it for a while because they know it's not just your opinion. It's the will of God basic instructions we need before we leave this earth. And Paul continues on. Still in 2 Timothy, now chapter 3, verse 16. There he says that all scripture, all of God's word, is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for, here's our word, instruction, and righteousness that the man of God may be perfect and truly furnished unto all good works. Once again, what's Paul telling us? He's telling us the same thing that we find out that the word Bible means. It is the basic instructions you need before you leave this earth. Paul's saying that all scripture is from God Almighty and it is profitable to you as a Christian. Every single day to be daily fed by that bread, that living word of God. It's profitable because it's the doctrine that governs your life as a Christian. It's the words you're supposed to hold yourself to as you go out and profess to be a Christian to others. It's profitable to you for reproof, to refresh yourself. To revise, to relook at all the time, not just on Sunday when a guy like me is up here talking to you. It's profitable every day of your life. 
to refresh yourself, to renew. How many times in life have we read a verse that we've read thousands of times? But you read it for the thousand and one time and you learn something you never knew before. Why is that? It's because God was infinite in his wisdom and knew that as we age in this life, we change. So a verse that speaks to you today is maybe one that didn't speak to you 20 years ago. Because we change as life goes on. And God's word is speaking to you at every single moment of your life. He goes on to say that it's profitable for correction. Boy, isn't that the truth? How many times in life do we mess up? Do we fall on our face? We screw up as a Christian and then immediately whatever we've done that was wrong, a verse pops right into that head, doesn't it? Rebuking you, reminding you who you're supposed to be. Or maybe you just flip to it in your study. You read through something and you realize, oh, I kind of do that once in a while. Profitable, isn't it? for that instruction, for that correction. The instruction, the basic instructions before leaving earth. And if we do these things, folks, Paul says, you're going to be a perfect, truly furnished Christian. You're going to be somebody who's wise in God's word, somebody who has the GPS, God's plan for salvation, and you know where you're going, why you're going, and you know how to get others there too. Truly, God's word agrees that the Bible is the basic instructions we need before we leave this earth. We go on. Our second word tonight is another simple one we've heard many, many times. The second word to live by tonight is the word faith. Which I have been taught here, it stands for for all I teach here. How many times in life do we take for granted the faith that we have as a Christian? Somewhere along the line, someone took enough interest in your life, took enough interest in you that your life mattered, that they wanted your soul to be saved, and they impressed upon you faith. Somewhere along the line, somebody introduced God to you, introduced the concept of faith to you. God's word tells us in Hebrews that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. No one in this room tonight has ever seen the face of God. We've never heard his voice, but we believe, don't we? We believe that when this life is over, when our eyes close for the final time, that's not the end. That there's something greater waiting for us. And as great and as awesome of a feeling as that is, the reason we come through those doors every week with hope in our hearts, are we doing that for someone else? Are we being that person for someone else in this life? Do we remember that faith also includes for all I teach here? No better place in God's word is this ever illustrated to us than in Acts, the eighth chapter, verse 31. Here we find Philip has joined himself to an Ethiopian eunuch that's in the middle of the Gaza desert and he's reading the prophet Isaiah. And Philip, one of the disciples of Christ, comes and joins himself to this man who's an unlearned and has no idea what he's reading. And as Philip approaches him, he says, do you understand what you read? And what does the eunuch say? How can I unless a man guide me? Is that not the cry of this entire world today? This entire country that doesn't believe in God and is moving as far away from him as they can? How can they understand why God should matter in their life unless someone takes the time to teach them? Why would someone that's never darkened the door of a church, who's never went to God in prayer, who's never flipped through his pages, why should they suddenly care if no one takes the time 
to show them the reason why. It's a pretty good thing, isn't it? Every time I read this, I think of the awesome responsibility of a Christian. Look how few of us there are in this room tonight. It could be filled, couldn't it? Us compared to the folks out in this wide world, there's very, very few of us in comparison. And that's why it's so important for you and I to pass on what was given to you. Pass on what somebody did for you in your life. Be a person that gives faith to others. Because there's a lot of folks tonight that have no idea who God is and have no idea why they should even care. How can I understand unless someone takes the time? Are we taking the time? The folks we come in contact with in life, the co-workers, the acquaintances, the family members that we know it's going to be a fight. Are we taking up that fight? Are we taking the time because we care about their souls? Because faith isn't just reserved for us. It's reserved for all I teach here. Is it going to be easy? No. Is there going to be folks you're going to have to work, 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 work on for a long, long time? Maybe many, many years? Yes. Do we give up? God forbid. Somebody took the time in your life to pass on faith to you. And that's why it's so important for us to never get up, give up and also to all be ready to pass it. And Peter tells us about this in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. There Peter says that as a Christian, we need to be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you for the reason you have hope within you and you're to do it with meekness and fear. What's Peter saying? Peter is saying that at any time, anywhere, you should be ready as a Christian to pass your faith on to somebody else. Because you don't know where someone's salvation begins. It could begin in the grocery store aisle at Respects. It could begin in the parking lot of a Walmart. It could begin in the lunchroom at your place of employment. None of us know where someone's salvation begins. And that's why it's so important for us to be ready. Because folks, once in a while, those questions are going to come. And that's a glorious moment that we need to seize. When someone actually takes the time and is interested enough to ask you a religious question. Who is God? Do we have an answer? Who is God to you? What does he mean to your life? Why would someone want to take God on in theirs? How could he change their life? What do we tell them? Are we ready always with an answer? Can we give an answer why we sit here tonight with hope within us? Can we give an answer why God means everything to us and he's number one in our life? For all I teach here, how can we ever expect someone to want to take faith on and their life if it means so little to us. We need to be ready, folks. We need to have a passion, a desire, an ability to teach others and pass our faith on to somebody else. And Jesus Christ, above all, tells us the importance of this. In Matthew, the 28th chapter, verse 19 and 20. And some of the last words he imparts upon his disciples before he's to ascend back into heaven are these words. He says, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all things which I have commanded you, and lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of the world. What was our Savior telling us? Take the faith that I've shown you. Take the love that I've shown you. Take all the belief that you have in your heart and give it to anyone you come in contact with. All nations. Do not exclude anybody. Let go of the preconceptions in your head of thinking, of thinking that someone is never going to believe. Stop looking at someone and saying, they're never going to listen, they're never going to listen, they're never going to listen. 
Teach all nations. Teach them to observe the things I've commanded you. Do not let your faith die with you. Pass on what you believe, what your heart holds is true, what you have learned. Yes, faith truly does also encompass for all I teach here. Faith is not only reserved for ourselves, but for all those we take the time to teach it to. For all I teach here. Our next word to live by, number three. Another simple word, one we love. Number three, a word to live by is joy. Oh, we all like joy, don't we? And I've been taught in life that joy stands for Jesus, others, and then yourself. If we're able to come in life to a point where we start living our life this way, I guarantee you, you will find true joy. If you can come to a point in your life where you start putting God and Jesus Christ first, then others, then yourself, you're going to know what true joy is. And God's word agrees. Paul reminds us of the words of our Savior in Acts the 20th chapter, verse 35. There he says, remember the words of our Savior, how he said it's more blessed to give than to receive. You know, that's a phrase we hear a lot of times, don't we, around the holidays especially. Oh, it's better to give than receive. How many folks have no idea that those words come from the Bible? What Christ is reminding us and Paul was reminding us of here is to find true joy in this life. You need to come to a point where you start putting others ahead of yourself. And we don't have to look too far or search too far to remember that, do we? How many times in life have you helped someone without any benefit to yourself? You see a need, you, you know someone is in a desperate state and you just take it up on a whim. You go and you help that person out with no benefit to yourself. And then what happens? You see the reaction, don't you? You see the smile that crosses that person's face, maybe the tear that trickles out of their eye. And then how do you feel going home? You feel great, don't you? You feel awesome. You feel like this is the way you want to feel every day. And why do we feel that way? Why? Because it's what's right. It's what God and your Savior intended for you. To go through this life and know the true joy of helping someone else. And in turn, you're going to help yourself. You're going to help yourself feel so much better. You're going to help yourself find fulfillment. There's a word we hear a lot. A lot of folks in life say, I have no fulfillment. I'm miserable. I don't know. I don't understand anything. I don't understand why I can't find purpose in life. I have no fulfillment. You want to find fulfillment? Start putting others ahead of yourself. And you're going to find it. And as Christians, we want to have even more of an indication how important this is. The word joy, Jesus, others, and yourself. Think about this verse that James gives us. James chapter 1, verse 27. There James tells us that pure religion and undefiled before God is this. To visit the fatherless, the widows, folks in their afflictions, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That is a lot said in one verse. What is James saying? James is saying that if you want true joy in your life, you want to be close to God, you want to live a life that he's proud of you, start living one where you put others ahead of yourself. Because if you do the, fo the purest form of religion unto God, pure religion and undefiled before God, just think of that language, pure and undefiled before God is this, to do things for others. Visit fatherless, visit widows, take care of folks in their affliction and keep yourself unspotted from the world. That's the purest form of religion unto God. What's it simply saying here? The purest form of religion unto God 
is the person that puts others before themselves. The one who finds true joy in this life is the one who puts Jesus, others, and then their self. How many times in life, uh, you know, we look at some of these and folks will say, oh, I don't want to go to that funeral home. I can't stand to see people like that. I don't want to remember them that way. I don't want to do it. What's it telling us here? Pure religion and undefiled before God is this to visit the fatherless. How do you become fatherless? Somebody has to die. Widows, somebody has to die. And people in their afflictions. This is a not only a request of God, it's a commandment. We are supposed to put others before our own needs. Stop worrying about it's uncomfortable to me. I don't want to go. I don't want to see them that way. I don't want to remember them that way. Stop worrying about you. And start worrying about them. The folk that the person that lost their father, their spouse, the person that needs you. The person that's laying on a bed of affliction that needs a prayer, a smiling face, an encouraging word. Yes, folks, in this life, if you want to be pure and undefiled before God, you want to find true joy within your own soul, start finding a way to truly find joy by living your life in a way where you put Jesus, others, and then yourself. And folks, finally, our fourth and final word tonight. Words to live by. Another one we've heard many times. Sitting in these pews. The word grace. It's been taught to me that in life. The word grace stands for God's riches. At Christ's expense. That pretty well sums up the word grace too doesn't it? Anyone who's ever been graced by God. And has received the blessings that we take for granted. On a daily basis knows that it was all made possible thanks to our Heavenly Father and His Son. The reason each and every one of us sit in this pew tonight with hope in our heart that eternal life can be ours is thanks to Jesus Christ. The grace that was given us is truly God's riches at Christ's expense. And God's Word agrees. Once again, Paul tells us in Romans, the sixth chapter, verse 23, that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. What's Paul saying? The wages of sin, the price of sin was paid for you thanks to the gift of God through Christ on the cross. The price was paid. The value of sin in your life was washed away and forgiven. And all you have to do is lead a godly life. Read these words, live by them, be baptized, and heaven can be yours. The wages of sin, the price of sin, the price of this wicked world was cleansed by the blood of our Savior. How often do we take that for granted? It's something we do in remembrance every week, don't we? As we surround this table in front of me. We partake of those emblems in remembrance of our Savior and what He did for us. We realize the great price that was paid. And we realize how much, not only of a price that Christ paid, but our Heavenly Father as well. Having to, can you imagine looking down on your your son or your daughter, your granddaughter, your grandson, and watching them be tortured, watching them be crucified, watching them be killed by a group of people who could have cared less about them or you. And knowing you had the power to stop it and you don't. Because you love those people that much. There is no greater love than that. The grace we sit here with this, this evening in our heart is truly God's riches at Christ's expense. I came across this in my study and I thought this was a fitting way to end the lesson. And if it doesn't sum up how we all feel about grace, I don't know what will. If you go to Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, 
There Paul says, thanks to the grace of God, I am what I am. Does that not pretty much sum up who we are? Thanks to the grace of God, thanks to God's riches at Christ's expense, I am who I am, what I am, and I am the ability to get to heaven. Isn't that awesome? Thanks to the grace of God, I am what I am. Thanks to the grace of God, we have every single thing we could have ever wanted in this life. And we're going to have every single thing we could have ever wanted in the life here to come. God's riches at Christ's expense. Yes, folks, tonight we shared some words to live by. Bible, the basic instructions we need before leaving earth. The remembrance of faith and how it's not just reserved for us, but for all I teach here. The way we find true joy is putting Jesus, others, and then ourself. And finally remembering that grace truly re means God's riches at Christ's expense. Words to live by. Folks, the lesson's yours. If there's anyone here tonight who's heard God's word and has been moved to believe it, you now have the chance to come forward. Let God know that you've heard, that you believe. Repent of the sins you've committed in life. Confess you believe Jesus is the Son of God and be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins. Or for some reason you don't feel like you're as close to him as you want to be, there are faithful men here to pray that you be re-strengthened and come back with the Lord. If you have either one of those needs, won't you come as we sing the song of invitation.